Greetings in Jesus' name. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I appreciate your patience with me these last couple of weeks. I am saying this to you that I currently, <laughs> looking at the calendar, uh, expect to be doing a Zoom every Monday night except the Monday night at pause, which would be not next Monday, but the Monday after that. Um, we'll be doing one or plan to do one the week of Monday night of Thanksgiving week. And then first two weeks of December after that, we're probably going to take off those uh, final two Mondays of December. But that's the that's the plan. That's the direction for now. And uh, I will let you be the first to know if it changes. Praise God. Um, I say this. Uh, I hope I don't have to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I am not a fear monger. I do not believe in manipulating people's emotions. What the Lord does with a person's spirit and emotions, that's his business as uh, a conduit. Uh, my responsibility is to hear what he wants to say and say that like he wants it said. And what impact that has is his business, not mine. So uh, I honestly have no fear. I have peace, absolute peace in the Lord. But saying all of that, uh, I, I know what, my, what the Lord is saying to me in my spirit. And it does not matter how the election goes tomorrow. Change is happening. Uh, the last I saw, there was at least four states that have already activated the National Guard to deal with uh, election protests. I think that's a drop in the bucket. I honestly don't think it matters who gets elected tomorrow or whenever all of that's finalized. I, I think there is going to be major upheaval in this country because politics in this country stopped being about positions and parties and it started being about personalities at least as far back as uh, 2015, 2016. Uh, it's not about uh, politics it's in, in the sense of uh, positions and policies and all that stuff. It is uh, voting for a personality and against a personality. And the feelings are so strong right now that uh, they're right now, nothing would surprise me. And uh, I, every bit of this is in the will of God. I don't think I have to defend the fact that I believe in spiritual warfare, but I believe in spiritual warfare. I believe in biblical spiritual warfare. I believe in warring against that which the Lord wants warred against. And I believe praying for grace to endure what he wants us to endure. Uh, there were storms that he delivered them from on the Sea of Galilee, and there were storms that he delivered them in the storm on the Sea of Galilee. And it's God's prerogative to decide what he's going to do is deliver us from the storm or deliver us in the storm. But I, I, I'm not trying to be unkind, and I realize that there are people on this call who are quote unquote saints. And uh, for you to take, if your pastor is not on this call or any call, for you to take anything that I say and use it as a weapon against your pastor is totally wrong. If that's your attitude and motive, you're, you're, at, you're requested to immediately withdraw from this call. 
if you're collecting information to use against your pastor because you don't like what he's doing or not doing or he doesn't see what you see, then you're wrong. You, you're wrong. Uh, that's not the purpose of this of this uh, ministry of this time together. This is about you and the Lord personally. Even if you are quote unquote a preacher, this isn't about you and your church. And there's no intention here to tell you how you're supposed to be running your church. The purpose is uh, for every one of us to examine ourselves in the word of God, compare ourselves in our ministry with the word of God so that we each can do what we need to do. For instance, uh, the scripture says that we're to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, if your church isn't doing that at all, if you're using that as an excuse for why you're not witnessing to every creature that God leads you in front of or the ones that he makes it very clear you're supposed to talk to, that's between you and God. That's not on your pastor or your church or whatever. So the, the point here is, Every one of us is responsible for being prepared for what's coming. I have read this before. It's been a little while, but I, I felt the start here tonight. Uh, I don't think I'll be long with it, but on the morning of, on Friday morning, January the 20th of 23, uh, I was in Houston at the sanctuary, brother born with, uh, uh, we were doing a pause meeting. I wasn't the one speaking first. We were praying leading up into that, that beginning of the session. And the Lord spoke to me very clear, very clearly. And he said these words to me, change is coming. And I waited for more and I didn't get more. And he said, go write that down. Well, I thought to myself, well, I can remember that. He said, go write that down. Well, I've learned what that means. Uh, I sat down and I wrote in my iPad a word from God today, parentheses, 1 20, 23, pause Houston, 10 05 a.m. And I wrote, Change is coming and it started. And I'm going to read you what he gave me, what I wrote at that point. Just as COVID forced adjustments to ministry methods and a refocusing of spiritual efforts for the church even though the cause of the crisis will be from a different type source than a sickness or plague, a similar spiritual crisis is coming that will affect the church even more directly than COVID. We can prepare now while there is still a small space of time, or we can try to adjust in the midst of the storm. The Lord is giving us a choice of how and when we will prepare now or then, but we will make a choice as to when we will prepare intentionally or otherwise. Our response will be a product of faith. And then he gave me a verse I've used a lot. Hebrews 11 and seven, by faith, Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So uh, I don't know what's coming. I tell you what I have and I don't, manufacture what I don't have. Uh, I am never intimidated by him giving me no specifics or much specifics. Uh, so I don't know what's coming. This is what he has said to me here. He's added, he's reinforced these things since uh, January of 23, but he hasn't added any more detailed specifics of what's coming, but in my spirit, and that's different than hearing a rhema from God, in my spirit, I feel very strongly that uh, uh, <laughs> there's some major, major things about to happen. Uh, I remind you of what uh, the scripture says concerning the church. And some of you've heard this. Some of you've heard probably most all of this. Not my problem. I'm only obeying God. Okay. But uh, um, the Lord commanded them. Uh, 
to tarry in Jerusalem till they be endued with power from on high. And he said, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, seven full chapters into the book of Acts, they hadn't gone anywhere. Hadn't gone anywhere. Uh, and the Lord gave Stephen a message. And Stephen preached that message. One of the most powerful messages that's anywhere in the scriptures. I mean, he laid it out. God's work in, in Israel and in the world all the way up to a certain point. And it was all positive, 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 positive. And then it, just like that, it changed and the Lord rebuked them. And when he rebuked them, they became angry and killed him. They killed Stephen. Uh, and when, uh, when they killed Stephen, uh, there was a young man named Saul who was standing by and he assented to what they de did, but he didn't throw any stones, but he held their coats while they cast the stones and killed Stephen one blow with a stone at a time. Uh, and whatever happened that day, so stirred up Saul that he became the chief crusader against those who believe what Stephen believed and he did a great, the scripture says, uh, Saul made havoc of the church at Roman or Acts 8, 1, 3, Acts 8, 3. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. And some of them he had killed or had, they were put in a position they were killed. But this is what the scripture says in, in Acts 8, 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, that could be read if, if read as an isolated statement. You go, okay, all right. So uh, they, they had to find some place where that was a little safer than Jerusalem. But when read in context of all that the Lord did and said, he had commanded them to go, commanded them to go, commanded them to go, and they hadn't gone. They stayed in Jerusalem. That was their safe place. That was home to many of them. That was, that was the capital of Israel, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they hadn't gone anywhere. And I, I haven't sat down and tried to figure out exactly how long it was from the day of Pentecost to uh, the time that uh, is spoken of in Acts chapter 8, verse 1. But it wasn't a few days. It wasn't a few weeks. It wasn't a few months. It was long enough that God waited and waited and waited for them to obey him, and they didn't. So the Lord spoke to, to Stephen, Stephen obeyed God and spoke those things that provoked his death and instigated the persecution against the church, which finally got the church to leave Jerusalem for their own safety. Now they got the first two parts. They didn't go to the rest of it, wasn't it? He said, you'll receive power to be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts. So they, they were scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, but they didn't get to the uttermost parts. Oh, I, I didn't emphasize the last three words, except the apostles. The apostles. They didn't leave Jerusalem. They become professional hiders. They hid themselves. Right. 
In fact, all the way through Acts 15, when Paul, who was Saul in chapter 8, they become converted, and he, now he's preaching, and he's out there preaching to the Gentiles, and all these Gentiles are getting saved. And it's a problem for the Jews because many of those Jews that they were encountering uh, uh, were they were Jews who only added the baptism of the Holy Ghost and baptism of Jesus' name to their Judaism. They were still Old Testament. They still were practicing the Old Covenant. They only added that, that one basic experience. They were called Judaizers. And uh, so when all those folks in Jerusalem heard about all these Gentiles getting saved, they wanted all the Gentiles to be taught to be Jews. And so they had the big discussion in Acts chapter 15, 15. And the scripture says, and, uh, and the uh, apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. Acts 15, the, the apostles were still in Jerusalem. Now, after that, uh, six chapters later, when Paul is being directed of God to go back to Jerusalem. And he met with the elders. There was only one apostle left in, in Jerusalem. That was James. So all the way up through Acts 15, it was the apostles, plural, and elders. But in Acts 21, it was James and the elders. So finally, the apostles left Jerusalem, but not by their choice. The Lord had to make it so uncomfortable for them that they finally left for their own safety. And the Lord told the 12 that he sent out in Matthew that when you're persecuted in one place, flee to another place. In other words, you're here preaching and you're being, you, you start to be persecuted. So the reason for moving on is you're being persecuted. That's what the Lord said. Well, that's exactly the way we conduct ourselves. We, we, we don't move on until it's more comfortable to leave than it is to stay. Well, there, you know, we, we, have, we have scriptures that have given us very specific commands. And they, they weren't doing it. Now, here's the problem. <laughs> a real problem it's really difficult to be an honest person and objectively look at what we do culturally <clears throat> and believe that that is obeying the scripture that's that's really hard to really hard to be objective in and espouse that we're obeying the scripture yeah and i've said it and i'm going to keep on saying it i am not taking a stand against us having church buildings and gathering in those buildings that we call churches i'm not taking a stand against that okay i am taking a stand of the church buildings being our safe spaces where we don't obey God, we don't go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We don't. And God's going to change that. I, I don't have to talk anybody into changing. The Lord is going to take care of it. Exactly how he's going to do it, I don't know. I read to you what he gave me. I've made those statements, quote unquote, publicly. I streamed them. Uh, when we were uh, being quarantined during COVID, I made those statements. God spoke those things to me in March and April and May of 2020, and I and I, it's recorded. I I made the statements that God said that COVID is 
us dealing with footmen, but how, what are we going to do when the horsemen come? And uh, it's coming because we are not obeying the word of God. The church building is not our problem. It's our religious tradition and culture that makes everything we do about a building. And I've used this illustration many times and will many times more, I'm sure. Uh, it would be foolish to preach to a farmer not to have a barn. A farmer, especially one with a very, very large field, needs a barn. They need a barn. I'm not preaching against the church not having a barn. I'm having, I'm, I'm taking a stand and others do too against the church using the barn as the focal point of ministry when you can't grow crops in a barn. You have to sow seed in a field. But we don't do those things. We don't do those things. We don't do them. And of course, our problem is that we, we believe we are called to save people. I'd like to see book, chapter, and verse for that. When he said specifically, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, period. Then he said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. There is no hint here that he's expecting those that are proclaiming the gospel, sowing the gospel seed in the field. The field is the world. There is no, there's, you have to stretch the scripture significantly to be able to take the position that we are responsible for persuading people to believe. We're not responsible for that. That would be like saying to the farmer, okay, now here's the seed, there's the field. Go sow that. Now I want you to keep guard over this field, this field and talk these seeds into germinating and producing a crop. Well, if we said that to one another, we look at each other like we were crazy. But we think that the seed can't do the job it's supposed to do unless we are involved persuading people to believe. That's not in the, that's not what the book says. The power of life is in the seed, not in the hands of the sower. The sower went forth to sow. The sower sowed the seed. The seed grows. When it finds a, its place in the soil, and the temperature is right and the sun's shining and there's enough liquid, uh, there's liquid nourishment or whatever, then there is there are signals that are triggered in the DNA of that seed that the conditions are right and it germinates and begins to grow whatever it is, is a seed of. The farmer doesn't make that seed germinate. Does it do it? And at the expense of embarrassing myself and anybody else, uh, all the human race exists because seed is implanted in a womb. Well, the seed sower doesn't do anything but plant the seed. Nothing else. And no more influence. The seed's planted. And then if the seed meets the fertile soil of the womb, then <laughs> there is uh, conception. And the seed sower has no control over conception. That's all up to the seed. And the egg that it germinates. Yeah. <laughs> God created all that. He created the agricultural principles. 
He created the principles of 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 conceiving, and then the gestation period and the the birthing of the baby. None of those things are controlled by men, except the farmer sows the seed and the father sows the seed. That's it. The power's in the seed. Well, you know, our our uh, goal-oriented humanity, we want to have goals. We we want to we want some tasks we can do. We got we want some tasks we can accomplish. Because if we have goals and we have tasks we can accomplish and we can take the credit for what happens because we had a goal. No. God's not sharing his glory with anybody. Now, that seed the farmer sowing is so powerful it can germinate in wayside ground. It can germinate and grow in stony ground it can germinate and grow in thorny ground it doesn't need just it doesn't need just good ground to grow now the ultimate results of what's growing may be affected by the soil but the seed does its job the seed germinates and begins to grow whatever that seed represents and so when the sower whoever's Proclaiming the gospel to every creature, that word so is it literally means also the broadcast. So the one that's just spreading that seed. Now, do I believe in home Bible studies? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But the Lord uses two primary different types of uh, allegories of, of agriculture. One is the wheat harvest. And the wheat harvest is raised by plowing the ground and then you scatter the seed and you don't do a thing in that field until it's ready to be harvested. The other allegory that's used is planting, planting. Planting is done deliberately. There are some types of seed that require planting. You, you, you have a spot, you, you put it in a certain place, at, at a certain depth, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, Jesus said of the Pharisees after he had uh, discussed their traditions with them in Acts chapter 15, he said of the Pharisees, every plant that my heavenly father did not plant shall be rooted up. But planting a plant is a different kind of agriculture than sowing a seed, a grain for a grain crop. And the Lord mixes metaphors. Obviously, he goes from a harvest field to a, a sheep flock. But he's not, these are not conflicting things. He uses the principles of one type or one thing to demonstrate certain certain things he's wanting to for us to understand. And then he uses a different type of metaphor to explain other different types of things he wants us to understand. And so uh, <laughs> he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's a grain harvest. But again, when he talked to... Uh, uh, the um, Pharisees, he said of the Pharisees, every plant that my heavenly father hasn't planted shall be rooted up. And the next statement he said was, if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall to the ditch. Both of those statements were about the Pharisees and them following their traditions rather than obeying the word of God. So again, again, uh, he talks about the grain harvest. And going to all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature is not planting, it's sowing. How do I know that? Because it is it is a reference to broadcasting seed. 
The word preach there in the Greek does not mean sermonize. It has nothing to do with standing in pulpits in holy buildings dedicated for the use of the church so much that we call the building a church, standing behind sacred desks and preaching a sermon. It has nothing to do with that. The Greek word uh, literally means to proclaim it, it, is, uh, it, it speaks of a, a town crier, someone who is using their voice to, in, in, in a broadcasting manner to send forth news or uh, whatever it is that they're communicating. And it is a proclamation. And uh, the, the idea of proclaiming good news. I've got good news for you. We are all sinners, but somebody has died in our place that was able to do it, shed their blood so that you and I can be forgiven. And they rose again, and they're going to take us. However, you want that the Lord tells you to do that. But the proclamation is the good news. Now, most of you on this call have been around Pentecost for years. And I'm going to ask you a question. If the purpose of God is us um, <laughs> inviting sinners to church so that they can hear a sermon preached so that they can get saved, then why is it that the great majority of evangelists and the great majority of the messages preached by evangelists is not the gospel? So if that's how we're going to do it, we're going to have church services, invite sinners to church so that they can hear the gospel. And then every time an evangelist gets up for the purpose of preaching to sinners and doesn't preach the gospel, then they're doing something other than being an evangelist which blows the whole purpose of what we say is the reason we're having church and inviting people there is so they can hear the gospel. But of course we know culturally the problem is, and it is a cultural problem. Uh, it's kind of hard to get saints to come if you're preaching to sinners because they, they want to be preached to. I've said this many times and I'll say it here now because that's what I feel to do. You want to prove me right? I tell you what, let's do it the other way. Prove me wrong. For the next four Sundays, preach only to the sinner, no matter who's there. And if you haven't had at least one precious saint, by the end of that three or four weeks, come to you and say, Pastor, we need to be fed. When are you going to preach to us so we can be fed? then you'll find the problem, and it's the problem. And the problem is <laughs> we all cave in to the pressure of preaching to those that are there. And so, so hey, we, we got uh, 100 people there and one sinner. And, you know, we, 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 we don't want to lose anybody. We don't want anybody to not come back. So what are we going to do? We're not going to preach to one sinner with a hundred saints sitting there. We're not going to do that. We just, <laughs> we, we, we're just not going to do it. Oh, there's a few odd ducks <laughs> like me that might try that. Uh, but I've had that happen. You see, pastor, what about, what about, what about the saints? When are you going to preach to the saints? We need to be fed. And of course, being such a kind and gentle person, I, say, I said to them, well, if you're starving that badly, why don't you learn how to study the Bible for yourself so that you can feed you and work along with us to try to reach the lost? Now, of course, that goes over really well, doesn't it? 
what all that proves is we 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 say we're doing certain things, but when the push comes to shove, we don't do that because we're afraid of losing what crowd we've got if we do that. But we don't do the other either, you see. We don't do that. Well, the problem is, and uh, I haven't even come close to what I thought I was going to talk about tonight, uh, but that's his business, not mine. But the pro the problem is, <laughs> He's the one that commanded that we, believers, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Not preachers, believers. So, <laughs> the, the five signs, Mark 16, 17, verses 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them that believe. Verse 20 tells us the purpose of signs is to confirm the word. Well, who's speaking the word that the signs are going to confirm the word for? Well, the signs are following believers, not preachers. That means the believers are out speaking the word and God is working signs and wonders and miracles through the believers to confirm their word. The Lord's not letting us go on forever. It's not doing it. It's going to change. It's going to change whether we want it changed or not. He's changing it. His word will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. His word is going to be fulfilled. And just like he said with the praise when he was entering Jerusalem on the back of the, the colt of the donkey and the, those who were not his followers, but were religious people said, master, tell them to stop. And he says, if they stop, the rocks are going to cry out in their place. What does he mean by that? Well, I mean, he can do it literally. He can cause rocks to cry out. He can do that. He's God. He can do that. But what if he's really saying is, there is no link that I will go to for my word to be fulfilled. There's no link that I won't go to, excuse me, to fulfill my word. I'm going to do whatever is necessary for my word to be fulfilled. That's exactly what he's going to do. And this is negative. I'm not screaming and yelling at anybody. I, I'm not trying to cause somebody to be fearful. I'm telling you what the word of God says. The word of God says that God's going to fulfill his word. His word's not returning unto him void. It's going to accomplish whatever he sent it to do. And when when it was the man Christ Jesus himself, post-resurrection, pre-ascension, who is giving them such clear direction. I mean, you talk about miracles to confirm the word. The dead was resurrected. He appears inside rooms without walking through doors. He, uh, he ascends into heaven right there in front of God and everybody. <laughs> he ascends into heaven. And if that wasn't enough, then two angels are floating there in the sky speaking to approximately 500 people and saying, Hey, uh, 
go do what he told you to do because he's coming in again one day just like uh just like he told you he was same way he's going up he's coming back the last place on this earth that his feet touched the ground was the Mount of Olives. The next time his feet touched the ground on earth, his feet will touch on the Mount of Olives. And uh, that's not the rapture. I mean, that is the rapture. That's not the second coming. Uh, the second coming is when his feet's going to touch the earth. We're going to, in a rapture, we're meeting him in the air. He's not coming down to the earth. We're meeting him in the air. That's proof that it's two different things. We're meeting him in the air. Uh, and then at the second coming, we're coming back with him, but he's going to stand on the Mount of Olives. It's going to, going to break into earthquake, whatever, all that. But his last place his feet touched the ground was the Mount of Olives. The next time his feet touched the earth is going to be on the Mount of Olives. He's going to fulfill his word. It's impossible for God to lie. Well, the question then comes down to this. If you're a part of his church, and it's his church he's counting on to be the instruments of the fulfillment of his word, and we're so bogged down in tradition that we got from two or three uh, levels of uh, revelation being given a go all the way back to our church services basically are following a similar pattern of uh, the Methodists, the original Methodists, including the altar call. I mean, that's where we got all that. We just kept, we kept adding new stuff, but keeping the old as much the old as we could all these 100 plus years, 200 years, whatever. And, you know, we don't get rid of something until we don't have any choice but to get rid of it. We're going to hang on to it because it's our heritage. Well, uh, the Lord has a way to deal with heritage. He has a way to deal with those things that are in the way of the fulfillment of his word. And he will be doing that. He's doing it. Now, <clears throat> this stuff is flesh. I promise you it's flesh. This humanity likes the fact that I am free to go wherever, whenever I want to go. Uh, I'm speaking not spiritually about his direction, but my rights as a citizen that I am pretty much free to say whatever it is I want to say and with minimal likelihood that I'd actually end up in jail for it right this moment. I might get uh, somebody trying to kill me, but it wouldn't be official. It would be whatever. But, uh, you know, all, I, 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 I like this. I like that my uh, sons and their wives are essentially safe. My grandchildren are safe. My great grandchildren are healthy and thriving and all that. I like the fact that, uh, I'm able to, uh, get in the car, go for a ride with my wife. Uh, last week we drove up to new England for our 60, 56th anniversary and looked at leaves and just spent some time together. And, uh, I like that there's freedom to do that, that I don't have to get a permit to do that. I don't have to ask somebody permission to go do that. I, my humanity likes that, but that's not, it's going to change. It's got to change. It can't, it can't not change. It can't not change. And I'm saying this to you, uh, those of you that are stressed out over who's going to get elected tomorrow, you hear me, I'm going to tell you this right now in the Holy Ghost. It is not going to matter who gets elected. God is going to fulfill his word. It doesn't matter. And you can get all stressed out about it you want, but it doesn't matter. 
and you can have angst because of who gets elected or you can have breathe a sigh of relief over who gets elected, but it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. God is going to fulfill his word. Don't forget, for those of you that believe Trump is going to save us, the pandemic started during the last year of his, preg his pregnancy, his, pre his presidency. He's the one... They had lead, led us all shutting down and quarantine all that stuff. The Trump, the savior. So it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <clears throat> and so I, I'm, I'm saying to you, <laughs> I've already voted who I voted for. It's none of your business, but I voted because I'm an American citizen. It was my responsibility to vote. Uh, do I think that's going to make any difference? Uh, nah. No. This thing is going to go the way that God wants it to go. He's going to put in there, and he's going to do whatever's necessary to put in there, whoever it is he wants in there, so that he can do it the way he wants to do it. The Bible says he sets kings up and puts kings down. That's not an exact quote, but it's that's what it says. He's in control of that. Not the American electorate, not the Electoral College. But they stole the election for Trump last night, the last four years ago. If they did, God allowed it. He allowed it. But we're worse off now than we, yeah, that's right. Because the promise he's made about revival can't come to pass in a country that is complacent. Remember what he said about the Laodiceans. They thought they were rich and increased with goods. But they didn't know that they were wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And God is got, has got to allow things to happen to this country so people see themselves for what they are from God's perspective rather than what they think they are. I've said this before. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what your politics are. If we're 33 tri or whatever it is, close to that, $33 trillion in debt, And we're only solvent because we're we're printing the money. Come on, come on, that's that is such a house of cards that the slightest breeze could blow it down when God's ready. He wouldn't even have to do anything major to get it to collapse. Well, you know, what about our future? Well, where is your future? What is your future? Is your future whatever the Bible says, or is your future uh, looking forward to here? As a human being, would I like to see my great-grandsons grow up and see what's going to happen to them? I've got three unmarried, four unmarried grandchildren. Uh, one trying very hard to get married uh, and three others that aren't old enough yet, but already planning on it as a human being. I wouldn't, would, I'd, I'd love to see how that's going to play out, but that's not what this is about. It's not what it's about. So if this is depressing to you, uh, that, that ought to say something to you about your faith. I don't know when I'm going to uh, <clears throat> release it. There is an email going out tomorrow that's going to have a PDF attached to it that's pretty strong. But a couple of uh, nights ago, in fact, it was... Uh, <laughs> We came back through West Point. 
I hadn't been there, but one other time, it was a long time ago, and my wife and I spent the night at the Thayer Hotel uh, at the United States Military Academy on the Hudson. And uh, the Lord woke me up, uh, which he's been doing a lot of the last month or so. Uh, there's hardly more than two nights go by that he doesn't wake me up talking to me. And, but this particular time, it was, it was, this was just, uh, this was amazing. I, uh, he woke me up or it was early, early, early. And I took my iPad and he's talking and I went took went into the bathroom, closed the door so I could dictate without um, disturbing my wife. And uh, I opened up the note app, turned on the dictate button, and just started talking the stuff that was coming into my mind. And uh, that went on for about twenty minutes just not thinking, just listening and speaking it into the microphone of the iPad. And uh, there was such an, a, a presence of God that was there. I, I almost felt transported. I was into a, a place that was beyond where I have been other than maybe once or twice in my entire life. And uh, the stuff he was talking about, he was talking about himself. He was wanting me to see him from his perspective. And he said to me, <clears throat> I want my people to have peace, but they can't have peace unless they really believe that I am truly in control of everything. And that no matter what happens, I'm controlling the ultimate outcome because I'm Lord of all and I am in control. And I am doing things or permitting things uh, because of course he can't do evil so in order for things that need to happen that are evil, he has to allow the, he has to give the adversary permission to do that. But the adversary doesn't have any authority to do anything unless he's given permission. And, uh, and that's what he's, he, that's what the Lord said that to me. He said, peace is a direct, is directly connected to a person's faith in my lordship over everything. And he said, my lordship over everything is called dominion. And I own the earth and I own the universe and there is nothing happening and or will happen that I am not permitting for my purposes, for my purposes. And I, I tell you something, the more that experience went on and the more he spoke, the more that the more peace I had. It was just he is in control. And it you may think I've just been kind of talking matter of factly. Well, I have been. Everything I've said this evening is just matter of factly. God's in control. And if it's a part of his plan that I get beaten ahead with a sledgehammer tomorrow, bring it on. Because it's all his plan. And I, I want peace with his plan. And he said to me, the opposite of peace, of course, is fear. And the degree to which you have fear is the degree to which you don't trust me. So if you trust me, you believe I'm in control, you trust my lordship, my dominion, then you have peace. 
If you have fear, you don't trust me. You don't believe in my lordship and my dominion. It's that simple. It's that simple. And it was just one of the most amazing experiences of my entire life. And this is, I hesitate to say this. I'm going to say it, but you just have to do with it what you will. I mean, I was, I don't know if I was in a trance or if I was half asleep, but I wasn't thinking at all. I was just sitting there holding my iPad, trying to be as quiet as possible to not wake up my wife and just speaking into that microphone, whatever came into my mind. And as it lifted, it didn't lift all the way, but it began to lift. And I, 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 it was later because that went on a while. I went out into the living room or went, went to the place where there was some place to sit. And I started, I started kind of coming more to, to myself and started reading this stuff. It wasn't gibberish. It wasn't, it wasn't nonsense. It was amazing. And I knew that didn't come from me. I knew it didn't come from me. I knew the condition I was in, either trance or sleep or some combination of the two, just literally not thinking, just saying whatever was coming to my mind because I was hearing what he was saying and repeating it. And I wasn't, wasn't trying to figure out where he was going or what he was doing with it. I was just doing that. And, and, and when it was all over with, it, I just had this feeling of that's how he wrote the book, the books. That's how he wrote them. That's how he was able to write stuff that the people writing it didn't know because he was just speaking it and they were writing it down. They're just writing it down. <laughs> literally, literally, I've said this to people and they don't believe it. I, I don't figure this stuff out. I don't figure it out. I don't sit around meditating on it, trying to figure it out. I listen. He speaks it. He explains it. I just write it down. No more complicated than that. Not a, and, and when that was over with, I thought, this is so not connected to my intellect at all, at all. It was just, it was amazing. But the problem was, okay, <laughs> the Lord didn't allow for there to be any room for human feelings. He was explaining himself from his perspective, not man's perspective. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's amazing. I, you know, I started to say, I can't wait. I can wait. I don't want, I don't want to hit the time frame to be altered at all. I don't want it to be slower than it's supposed to be. I don't want it to be quicker than it's supposed to be. I just want whatever his will is, however he wants it, whenever he wants it, that's the way I want it. I don't want it added to. I don't want it taken away from. I just want to be neutral so he can do and say through me whatever he wants to do and say, period. Whatever that feels like whatever positives or negatives that happen because of that. I just want, I just want whatever it is he's doing. I want it. I want to be a part of it. Praise God. Uh, <laughs> I, I pray that uh, this didn't come across as rambling. Uh I have felt these things very strongly and very deeply. And uh, I pray for you 
And for myself and my family, I pray for you and your family that you are prepared to let God be God in your life and through your life, no matter the price, no matter the price, no matter the price, that all of it can be done for his glory, by his name, for his name, in Jesus' name. I pray that you will allow him to be that to you, to be that through you for the for the for his name's sake, for his kingdom's sake, for the lost sake, for the church's sake, whatever it is. I I'm just <laughs> I'm almost giddy in anticipation over what's coming in. And I know, my humanity knows there are, from a human perspective, there's some negative things coming. There's some negative things coming. I know that because the Bible says it. The Bible says there's some things coming that my humanity would consider negative. To what degree my personal humanity is affected by them? I don't know that. But I know what the Word says. And I know... He's faithful to his word, and I know he cannot lie, and I know there are things that he said that he cannot come till those things happen. Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world uh, for a witness, and then shall the end come. That's not an exact quote. The whole world is going to hear the gospel somehow. Whatever the Lord considers the fulfillment of that verse, whatever he considers that to, the fulfillment of that to be, he is going to fulfill that because he cannot lie. He can't lie. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. If you, if you have to try to explain what that's really not saying, then you don't believe the Bible. I think that the most reliable way to interpret the scripture is believe what it says. <laughs> believe what it says. And there are certain things that are said that obviously were in to be figurative. They were obviously from the context, they were intended to be figurative and that we were supposed to allow him to interpret what that means from a, uh, what he was trying to say through the figurative language. But then there are saying, things he's saying, they're not figurative at all. Matthew 24, 14 is one of those that's not figurative because uh, the two verses before that says, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Is that figurative? But he that it shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Is that figurative? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for, for a witness unto all nations, then shall the end come. That's not figurative. But somebody has to be involved with him to be willing to be sent where they need to be sent, where there's nobody to preach the gospel, where it needs to be preached. Somebody's got to be willing to do that for the word to be fulfilled. And the problem we have here is the word nations literally means a race, a tribe, uh, <laughs> a multitude of individuals of the same nature or genus, a tribe, a nation, a people group. Do you know how many countries there are with multiple tribes within that country? By that definition of a tribe, there's multiple tribes within that country. I mean, they call this country the melting pot. Every tribe in this country has got to have the gospel preached to it. Every tribe. And I'm not just talking about 
American Indians. I mean, we've got all these folks that are Hispanics lumped into one big group of Hispanic. They don't lump themselves in that kind of group. And every tribe among those that speak Spanish is a separate group that has to be preached to for the word to be fulfilled. Somebody's got to do that. The Lord's not going to do that. He can't fulfill his word by him doing the preaching. He's got to have somebody to do that. But if we're so focused on building buildings and growing a church, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be offensive. Anybody here, but growing a church is not synonymous with evangelizing the world. Not even the same concept, not even the same focus, not even the same methods, not even the same goal, not even the same people, because most churches are grown around a personality in a pulpit. And those that are sent into the field are not preachers. It's all believers. So it's all believers that are sent forth to proclaim or announce the gospel to people that haven't heard it before. Every creature. This is his word. It's going to happen. And it might be a few days, weeks, months, year or two before we find out how whoever is elected tomorrow is going to contribute through decisions to that being accomplished here in this country. But you can't have revival in this nation with people comfortable, or if I could say it this unkind way, fat, dumb, and happy. More concerned about uh, who's winning the football game this weekend than they are about souls being saved. That's where we are. More concerned about our natural retirement than our heavenly home and helping people get there. That's going to change. It's going to change. And uh, I don't feel so bad about us because the early church forced him to do things to get them to obey. So we're just proven that their flesh and our flesh is flesh. But what he did to get them to obey, he, he's not going to do less to get us to obey. Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you for every individual that's been a part of this or that may watch this uh, message at some point later date in Jesus name in Jesus name I commit ourselves each of us to you father in Jesus name I commit us to you in Jesus name yet I loose the spirit of grace upon us to enable us to be sensitive to your spirit obedient to you your voice and your word that you would enable us, Father, to do your will. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. In Jesus' name. I, I started to bind the fear, but I can't bind fear because that fear is what God, your feeling is, what God is using to try to get the message to you of what you're not trusting him with. I said it already, what he said to me, peace is proof that I trust in his lordship and in his dominion. Fear is proof that I don't trust his lordship and his dominion. So I started to pray about the fear. I cannot. That fear is there 
for you to know that you don't trust him like he wants you to. I'm not sure when that that message, which is, as I have uh, prayed over it and uh, and work to allow him to say fully what he was wanting to say, which is the way he works with me, through me. Uh, I don't know how long it's going to be, but it's not short. Maybe 10 pages, 20 pages, 25 pages, I don't know. But it is a word. It is a word from his perspective. Uh, it's not the one that's going out tomorrow. Uh, but it's it. hopefully within the next week or so, it will be available to you. And uh, again, I can't pray against your fear. Your fear is his, him trying to get your attention that you don't trust him yet. Praise God. Thank you for being here. The Lord bless you. I love you. And I will see you uh, as the Lord wills next Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you.